So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jenny Heyman, and I'm a program manager with eCampus Ontario. Uh, and one of my great privileges in my work is to partner with the Open Education Fellows to, uh, to learn more about Open, to share more about Open on their campuses. Um, and so today I'd like to introduce, as part of our OEO Fellows webinar series, uh, Professor James Skidmore, who is Professor and Director of German Studies at University of Waterloo, um, and Michelle Singh, an instructor at La Cité, and Nick Baker of University of Windsor. And we're going to talk today about um, OER and policy in Ontario. So I'll leave it to you to introduce yourselves in more detail. Just a couple of housekeeping items. If you're, if you're listening in, if you can mute yourself as we go along, that just reduces a bit of background noise. Um, but you are welcome to turn on your microphone and ask a question. Um, I will be keeping an eye on the chat window and keeping an eye on timing uh, for the team, but this is uh, James's story, so I'm gonna let him take it away. Great, thanks very much, Jenny, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to take over your screens for a moment, or for a few minutes anyways, and uh, we'll start with that. We have a, an ex uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation we wanna share with you, and so I'm taking over your screens to do that. Um, uh, Big thank you to Michelle and Nick uh, for helping out on today's webinar, and a, and a big thank you to the rest of you for joining in. Really happy to see so many of you. Uh, just it's marvelous because <laughs> policy is not the most interesting topic, maybe. So it's really nice to have you all here. Um, our uh, what we're going to do today, we're going to um, go over a few ideas about policy um, and share those with you. Uh, I'll speak for a few minutes, then I'll turn it over. I'll turn it over to Michelle and to uh, Nick for their point of view on the on the on the topics we're raising, and then we'll open it up for a big discussion to everyone. So the if you have uh, questions, you may want to save them till we we open up that general discussion. But if something comes up that you really need to talk about, then please jump right in. Uh, but we we plan to be done by about uh, ten to one or so. Sorry, ten to two. And um, yeah, so I, I'm James Skidmore and I'm a, a prof at the University of Waterloo and I'm uh, uh, working with uh, eCampus Ontario on policy and well on open education and my particular area of interest is policy. And I'm, um, I'm working with eCampus Ontario as an OE fellow, but also I'm doing a special project on helping uh, eCampus Ontario develop um, a policy um, framework, if you will, that other inst that the institutions at the college and universities can use uh, to develop other, uh, to develop their own kind of policies around open. And I guess one of the big issues uh, for me is that uh, when we're talking about policies, we're really thinking about what, what the, what Ontario higher education institutions can do structurally to support and uh, uh, open education to improve the uptake of open education in the province. That's, that's really what this centers on uh, in terms of what policy is about and what policy, why we, why we talk about policy. And when we, when we do talk about policy, they're, they're kind of two, I see it as there being sort of two approaches. Uh, it, this has come to me at having, as being an open fellow with uh, eCampus Ontario and en attending conferences such as the uh, the big open global conference that was held in Delft uh, earlier this year and in other locations. There's a lot of desire on the part of open education practitioners to, uh, to see open really take off at their institutions. And, but there's always this discussion about what, what's the best approach to making that happen? Is it the bottom up approach where you, you do a lot of open um, activity in terms of, Profs taking on open resources or teaching centers um, providing open, uh, open education seminars and workshops to improve the uptake of open? Or is the top down approach the way to do it, where the institution itself, through policy, through strategic planning, through other means, incentives, uh, really creates a, a, an, open, an open culture at that institution? And as much as the open, uh, the people who are involved in the open education um, culture throughout the world have been working it from the bottom up, 
there's a real desire for more top down, more policy involvement from the institutional level. And it, 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 I provided just this little, this very, very simple X, Y graph, uh, axis kind of graph to, to, to make the point here. If, if we have, uh, if you look at the red star, the red point on this uh, slide, if we, have, um, if we have low institutional policy um, involvement at the university level, meaning so if policy isn't really established at a university level, it doesn't matter where along the the access there for open activity you it'll that star won't, won't get very very much higher that point on the graph won't won't move but if we can if we can create more institutional policy to support open activity we'll see just greater uptake overall and so i should have labeled this this very simple graph something like uh, the impact of uh, or open impact at an institution and to understand that open impact is going to be more than just activity. There has to be that institutional policy uh, involvement. So the policy needs to be a part of this equation. There are a number of issues that I think institutional policies could address. In in the open in the in the in the open education um, uh, uh, universe. There's a lot of talk about, about issues and basically about obstacles preventing uh, open uptake, for example. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of stigma, and this centers on, on so it's a sort of instructor-centric. For example, is an instructor um, nervous about using open for fear of exposure? Mistakes in their material could be noted, could be seen. Is there a concern about criticism? You know, that they, pr they put out their teaching materials and then people come along and say, oh, I want to teach it that way, I teach it this way, or what have you. Criticism on content, you're teaching that, why are you teaching that? This kind of thing. There's, always, there's of course, the, 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 the common refrain at institutions of higher education that teaching is valued less than research, and so putting effort into teaching is often considered a, um, a not wasted effort, but there's a, there's, a, there's a certain skepticism about how much effort to put into that. And that can depend on the institution, obviously. And then the, the, just the general notion that open educational resources might be less valuable and less, uh, the quality might be less than you'd find elsewhere. Now there's also that this, this, these stigma, uh, these issues feed into then the professional culture, obviously. Um, does open activity have enough prestige for the uh, for the open practitioner? And does the and does the uh, the research and teaching uh, that 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 is um, assessed in in review practices for tenure promotion uh, annual review uh, practices does that um, if if it's valued differently does that then lead to uh, less acceptance of open and then, and there's a certain a certain understanding or certain agreement that yes, this is true. I should point out that for some of these uh, ideas here about these 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 obstacles, uh, we've provided a, a list by. I have a very I have a super capable uh, assistant working with me, Mirto Provida, and she's provided a, a, a very short list of um, resources and is putting that link in the uh, in the chat so you can follow up on this at your on your own. Uh, there's there's a lot of literature out there on these issues. That third category there of intellectual property is um, is important because as as institutions become uh, as institutions are required really to deal with open access in Canada, of course, because of tri council funding requirements. That uh, also uh, crosses over into the teaching realm and how and and so who owns the materials uh, created by uh, instructors at uh, higher education institutions in Ontario. It's uh, and that's an issue where policy is just it's it's it. We need policy to sort those issues out, and we need the kind of policy that would uh, make sure that the openness of the instructors who want to make their materials open have the policy support to do so. So that's just a a very general overview of the issues involved, of some of the ideas uh, that we're thinking about with regard to policy and open education. I'd now like to turn it over 
to the uh, to my two colleagues who have joined on the, the 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 chat today. We'll start with Nick Baker, and Nick is the director of the Office of Open Learning at the University of Windsor. And Nick, I'll let you uh, take it away, and I will. If you do beep or something, I'll push forward your slides as you require. <laughs> Perfect. Can everyone hear me? Uh, okay now. Yep. Perfect. Uh, yeah, if you want to jump forward a slide for me there, James, that'd be great. Yeah, this so, one here. Yeah. Yep, that's perfect. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the policy landscape from a, a university perspective. Um, and I wanted to start with very quickly talking about the national landscape. So, um, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Ontario and my context here at Windsor. Um, from the national perspective you know as with most things in higher education in canada they're very different from province to province um and there there really is uh, one particular shining light when it comes to um open educational practices in canada and that is to look to british columbia obviously have a longer um they have a longer engagement with with the concept of open practices than than the rest of the country does uh, but still very young, still very young in that uh, in that process. So, in BC, uh, and also if you look across the border into the states, the, there's been a huge proliferation of activity around open educational practices over the last few years. And uh, in BC, you have um, uh, you have Kwantlen as the first university in the country to to develop ZCred degree programming. So entire credentials using only open or low cost um, or no cost to student uh, learning resources. But if you look what's happening over there now, you've got pretty much every university engaging with it in some way. Simon Fraser and UBC are also working on programming that will release soon. UBC is also the first um, institution in Canada to specifically recognize uh, using OERs or engagement in open educational practices in their tenure and promotion processes. So at the moment it is only in the educational leadership stream that they have, so there are two streams, um, traditional faculty stream and educational leadership stream at UBC. Um, but in BC there are, most of the other universities are working on a uh, language that would, would support that. So you can see it's actually a pretty simple change in their criteria, I've got that on screen there, um, where they just, they specifically list open education resources and repositories as uh, a contribution to their scholarly practice. Uh, James, can we jump to the next slide, please? Sure, can. There we go. Thank you. Um, so in Ontario, uh, eCampus Ontario obviously has been doing a lot of work and providing lots of support and generating a lot of interest around um, around open educational practices and use of OERs. And there are a number of places, and I hope this is not an exhaustive list, but ones that you would have seen recently um, talked about that have uh, internal grant structures, for example, to support open educational practices. Uh, we had our first one 2013, 2014, uh, opened up some, some internal grant funding. Queens and Ryerson have two new programs that are or revised programs that are running right now and most of those places have active committees um, that are either senate committees or they are institutional level subcommittees working groups looking at um, uh, looking at open educational practices and how to support them on campus so one of the things that eCampus has done really by uh, providing funding and by providing a, a forum in which to discuss these things is to legitimize them uh, in the same way that we legitimize uh, research in higher education. At the moment, we don't have any kind of really active Z credit initiatives, but I suspect that's going to change very soon in Ontario. Um, I know it's a topic of discussion here at Windsor, uh, things that we've been working on. It's, it's a real challenge, though. It's really difficult when uh, programs have so many different people involved, each of whom have, have uh, academic freedom, that they can absolutely exercise. Um, and student support here in Ontario, I mean, there is there is some activity in the student front, but it's certainly not as vocal and active as it is in the States or in DC. So that's another thing that we need to, uh, to allow that voice to be heard from multiple sides. 
James, could you just flick to the next one for me, please? Yes. So RPT, renewal, promotion, and tenure, whatever you call it at your institution, yeah. um, it, it matters. It really matters because it's the currency of the professorate in, high, in universities. And at the moment in Ontario, we don't have any uh, that I'm aware of at least that have managed to get OERs specifically addressed in their tenure promotion criteria. Um, what we do have is, I guess, a discussion around it in some places. Um, and there are some places who are starting to wonder whether where it fits, uh, which is also a good part of the discussion to have. So, you know, for Myself, I'm a teaching stream faculty, uh, similar to the UBC's uh, Educational Leadership Professoriate. Um, for us, in my department, so at the, the way that we work at the departmental level, we have our RPT criteria that we create. There are some very broad guidelines at the institutional level, but essentially each department can create their own um, and they can be quite different from each other. So in my department where we do have academic staff, we specifically recognize um, engagement with OERs and open learning, um, open educational practices in both the teaching and scholarship criteria. So a place to go might be to start with those teaching stream faculty, which uh, you know, makes a whole lot of sense. Um, and it may be a low stakes way to get universities involved in this. And pretty much all of us have some version of a teaching stream faculty member now. So, I think that's a useful place to start. James, I think there's one more. I believe there is, yeah. There we go. All right, so uh, I just wanted to quickly mention that the University of Windsor does have an actual Senate uh, past memo on reducing costs of student, re reducing costs of uh, learning materials for students. It's been around since 2012 and that was revised again in 2016 and adopted by Senate. Um, the issue is that people forget about it very, very quickly. Uh, but it, in essence, it says some really interesting things. So it says that faculty should always first look to uh, no cost options uh, rather than publishers uh, and consider the feasibility of open educational resources when they're assigning uh, learning materials. It secondly says that if, they, if those things don't exist um, as something like a textbook, then they should look to OERs and pull them together and create a series of open resources. Thirdly, it says if those things don't exist, <laughs> you should consider creating them and openly licensing them, licensing them which, um, you know, I'm, I, I still am flabbergasted that we managed to get this through Senate. Pretty sure no one actually read it, uh, but it's there and we can point people to it. Um, it. The challenge that we have is that we don't have uh, teeth for it right now. It's a, it's a kind of a memorandum or a set of guidelines, um, but it's a start. So I will leave it there, I think, and hand over to Michelle. Great. Thanks very much, Nick. Really appreciate that. And let me just then introduce Michelle Seng, who's a faculty member and senior advisor at uh, La Cité, a college in Ottawa. Uh, Michelle, welcome. Thanks, James. Hi, all. Uh, so, as James was mentioning, I'm a faculty member at uh, Collège Esté. Uh, Collège Esté is a French-only community college in Ontario, uh, in Ottawa, about 4,000-ish students. Um, and I've been teaching there for now 21 years. Uh, as some of you guys know, I'll be transitioning to a full-time role with eCampus Ontario here in the next couple of weeks. So, happy to, to be here with you guys today and chat a little bit around policy and what's happening with OER at the college level, and especially from my lens, which is my institution. So, um, and, and, and just before we get into the slides, I think um, a French institution is kind of interesting in terms of um, sharing materials and open education materials, because there's way less opportunities for us to work with publisher materials. There's just not the same amount of resources out there. We're not as as much approach by publishers to use their textbooks and, and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's a different context and I feel um, there's, there's something to be said about that context. So I'll kind of go through that as well and give you kind of in, some insights in terms of how we're looking at things at, at LASIT in terms of um, OER policy. 
Uh, so maybe James, you can just flip to the next slide. I'll just quickly give you a quick glance at what's happening on the OER side of things. I think Nick did a great job of laying the landscape um, in terms of um, globally or here in North America, how policies are kind of shifting. Um, so this slide is just about giving a bit of context around the OER and what's happening at the college level, which is a bit different that, than at the university level. So it's still very much early days in terms of adoption. There are some leaders out there. Uh, I've put down a couple of colleges there. I know Cambrian as, as well is very much a leader in terms of um, awareness around the OERs. Um, and and I, mean, I, think, I think awareness is super important in terms of um, figuring, out, figuring out policy. James talked about it. There's a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach, and I think awareness is really at the center of that. So uh, some colleges are really leading the way in terms of that. So um, um, thank, thank, thanks to them. OCLS, Ontario College Library Service, uh, has developed a great toolkit to raise awareness around OERs as well. And I put down the link there. So that's something that is slowly but surely making the rounds. Um, it's been translated, which helps a lot, um, especially for us, for us uh, two French-speaking uh, colleges. So, that's interesting, kind of uh, setting the, the context here in, at the college level. Um, there's also some chatter, a little bit like uh, Nick said, there's some chatter here around the province around Z degrees and uh, how, how some institution may position themselves um, in order to offer these degrees and, and, and um, entice students towards these programs. Um, you can switch to the next slide. I'll, I'll talk about the context of La Cite, uh, James. All right, so awareness is an issue uh, at, at, at in, in, for francophones in terms of OERs. I mean, something, something that always comes up when I, when I chat with OERs, either with, with admin stakeholders at La Cité or, or faculty members or even students, is the fact that a French context is very fertile grounds in terms of building uh, open educational resources. I mean, me as a faculty member for 20 years, I mean, I've created, adapted, translated a lot of material. It's kind of part of my day-to-day -day, um, uh, professional life. We, we do this all the time because there's not a lot of stuff out there. It's just not the same amount of quality, not the same amount of coverage of resources for, for, uh, for Anglophones. So it's kind of part of our culture to build stuff. The thing is, we, we don't, before this, this move towards open, we didn't really have any vehicle to share it and, and I mean, IP or intellectual property has always been kind of this little, a little bit muddy in terms of colleges because there's, colleges are different than the universities in terms of, of, of um, collective bargaining, right? Uh, colleges have one collective bargaining agreement and within that co uh, collective bargaining agreement, there is some language around intellectual property and the fact that what faculty members do in, in their professional life should be or, or, or produce in terms of their teaching and learning should be the propriety of the college. So there's always been some very muddy grounds in terms of who owns what. So open kinds of enables us. And I think francophones are really well placed because there's a lot of material being produced or adapted or translated. So I'm, I, I'm, I think at La Cité, there's, there's definitely an uptake in, in, towards the creating an institutional policy around open because there's, it's so, so much of a fertile grounds in terms of creating some, some, some resources. One of the things that's interesting in, in our talks about institutional policy is, is a lot of what we're creating and what we're interested in is not nearly, nearly tied to textbooks. So it, we're, we're trying to figure our way in terms of creating a policy that will talk about textbooks, but will also talk about resources in a broader sense. Um, so, so, and I think La Cité, this way of looking at it is we need to enable our professors to share materials with open licenses, do it from a top-down level so there's institutional policy to support it, but really enable people to be able to share anything. So, so small resources, PowerPoint, slide decks, whatever, make sure that we enable our, our, our faculty members to share. Uh, so in terms of policy, we're, we're, we're having some discussions around building this policy and at the same time, we're also having discussions about creating a tool that will enable sharing of open material in, in our community and broader at one point in time. So uh, we're already working with IT in terms of figuring out if we can't build a platform or a tool that would be accessible from our learning management system so that teachers could share and or uh, get some some open materials within our college and then to a broader 
with a broader perspective and be pulling in some resources from, from the outside and or sharing our own resources with the outside. So that's on, on our roadmap. I was just talking with the IT team this week about it. So I think it's, it's also interesting to see that uh, Atlas e it's not only about uh, policy, but it's also about creating tools that will enable that policy to happen. So, um, so that's kind of the landscape at La Cité. I mean, there's always concern of, uh, around ownership of resources. That's always part of the conversation with faculty and with administration. I mean, La Cité is really concerned about um, retaining, not, not retaining, but making sure that when professors leave the college, that we, we have some type of, of, of a legacy uh, of, of, that teacher's, um, of that teacher's material. So one of the things we're really thinking about is creating programs uh, for, for people that will retire uh, from La Cité. So maybe, maybe creating a program, like a one-year program just before retirement with funding, targeted funding for having these teachers build OER resources before they leave the college so that, they, that that's part of their legacy. So that's one of the things we're really looking at is creating those programs to entice these people that will be leaving us to, to leave something behind. Uh, so that's something that's kind of taking shape. We had a pilot last year with one teacher and it really went well. So I think we'll, we'll build on that. Uh, maybe Jane, just move to the next slide. Gladly, yep. Uh, one, of things that, one of the things I really wanted to share with you guys is a tool um, that's on the Lumen Learning website. So it's a um, OER policy development tool. So what it does, it's really inspired by three institutions uh, that have created their, their own OER policies. So I think it's the University of Edinburgh, uh, Vandenberg, um, Mer African Virtual University, and Tidewater Community College. So it, it does touch both universities and colleges. And it's a great tool because it kind of frames what an institutional OER policy should look like. And it, it draws in right, some statements from those institutional policies from the partners, for, so the, the three schools I mentioned. And it kind of frames the, not only the creating the policy, but also discussing about the policy. So it's been a great talking point in our meetings uh, to be able to loop in that tool and kind of look at it and say, okay, so how can we adapt this to, so that it makes sense for last day? So um, I think it's, it's probably, and it's also something, I think an institutional policy, an OER institutional policy must grow with the institution. So it can look uh, in some ways when we start off, but it needs to grow as, as, as we move forward. And I think that tool enables us to kind of think about a policy for today and potentially a policy that will evolve through time um, um, with feedback and with, with, with adoption. So those are kind of my thoughts. Um, about college landscape, what's happening at La Cité, and this tool that I find is, is very useful in terms of policy. And as you guys know, policy is not super exciting, but I think that having this tool for us anyways really uh, facilitated the discussion and the understanding around what we're trying to do. So James, back to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Michelle. Thanks for uh, pointing out the, the uh, Lumen policy uh, website. That's really helpful. Um, and, and thanks, Nick, as well, to you, for, you, for your comments. I really enjoyed hearing those. So we, we wanted to open it up now to, to, to all of you who've joined us today. And I've uh, just put up some discussion starters, some questions to just get you thinking. Uh, if you want to address questions to particular participants, please do so. But those three questions that I've just uh, thrown up there just, just to get us going, uh, what policies promote or discourage open practices at your institution? Because one of the issues when you're thinking about policy development is also looking at policies that work against open development and how you, how you perhaps um, deal with that. And also then what kind of policies do uh, you think are needed at your institution in particular or more generally? And of course, then what makes for good policy? And that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big question because there's a, uh, as Michelle was pointing out, a policy that can grow with the institution, uh, questions of sustainability. As Nick was pointing out in his comments, the, the issues that are involved at institutions where there are so many players involved. Uh, so for example, the issue surrounding tenure and promotion. If you have a couple of department members who aren't fond of open education or don't, uh, don't see the merit of it, that can, have ramifications throughout the whole 
process of tenure and promotion and how can policy work around that when you have so many different players with so so many opinions that they can hold on to uh, relatively easily thanks as nick pointed out to uh, uh, things like academic freedom so i'd like to throw it open to everyone I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen for the time being so we can discuss these questions and see each other and what have you so we'll do that and happy to hear any comments or um, ideas you may have there the floor is open Hi, James. I think Aldo has some uh, question in the comments as a starter. Ah, okay. Let me take a look at that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Aldo writes, within policies initiatives, does the terminology of textbooks, while well under understood concept, limit the imagination in terms of instructional strategies? For example, considering digital resources as a replacement for traditional texts, whether they are hard copy or digital. I think that's something you were addressing, weren't you, Michelle, in your um, work at La Cité? I, and I, I agree. I think is textbook may be um, a 20th century kind of idea that we have to get away from? What do you think, Michelle? Uh, thanks, James. Well, I, I think um, there's a couple of, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, I mean, I think textbooks uh, is, is an important part of, of OER. And I mean, I think the savings part of textbooks is enticing. It's a compelling story, right? You can save some money here by using open textbooks instead of published textbooks. So I think that's, and, and, and being able to adapt textbooks and stuff like that, I think that's very important. Now, the, the, the reality at a French college, and with that last day, is that the majority of what we use to support our teaching are not textbooks. Um, it's other resources. And so that's kind of my feeling. We need to figure out a way where we can share and, and, and adapt um, resources that are not necessarily textbooks. There's a lot of stuff, simulations. I mean, a lot of people are using simulations at last day. We want to share that. Uh, slide decks. I mean, there's so many things we need to share that are outside of the textbooks. Now, I, I understand why textbooks are important, but I think we really need to broaden the discussion and bringing other types of resources as well. Nick, did you have any comments? I'm wondering if that's something that comes up with your work at uh, Windsor. Uh, we can't hear you, Nick. Uh, physical oh. of the mic as well. Um, <laughs> Where's the so, policy on how to use the machines? <laughs> um, I think you know it's it's easy to have a conversation around textbooks because there are things that they're things that people understand as part of their regular work, but they don't often think about the other things that Michelle was talking about as being um, things that they should or could openly share. Um, and I had a, a very interesting and similar conversation with a faculty member just a couple of days ago who um, who was uh, applying to graduate from our from our new certificate program that we just stood up this year and he was concerned that he didn't have things that were oers and that that's not a requirement but it's it's one of the things that you can point to as evidence of your engagement in the practice and so he was kind of, he was all concerned about this. And we said to him, um, you know, you got all these videos that you created that you put out on YouTube that you said anyone can use. And there's all these little pieces of material that he's developed that he's also made out. And he said, oh, but don't I have to have like the exact license or it's not an OER and I can't talk about it? And we're like, no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but, but, you know, there's lots of people who are in that same boat. Uh, who don't necessarily think about all of the pieces that they that they have. That's interesting. Nick, there's a question for you from Rosary in the chat. That's, uh, uh, she writes that the U Windsor Senate statement is encouraging. Do you see that developing teeth? And what would be needed to develop the, those teeth? Just give me one second. I'm going to turn the lights back on in my room because they automatically turn off if, I, if it can't. Oh, yeah, I noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the sun is setting on. <laughs> While Nick turns on the lights, I'll just point out that Peggy has written to everyone as well in the chat. It's uh, Peggy French, who works with eCampus Ontario, and has, uh, points out that the repository that eCampus Ontario is building um, supports over 80 types of um, assets. Back to you, Nick, on the question from Rosalie. So I think it's a start, and it allows me to have a conversation um, you know, at Senate, I'll be reminding Senate that it exists tomorrow. Um, I'm also talking to, we have a Senate student caucus who are made up of half and half students and uh, faculty in other positions. 
I'll be reminding them that they came up with this thing yesterday, <laughs> tomorrow, um, and trying to extend that conversation into how it, it should be used now. And we're also looking at the resources from the Lumen policy uh, tool to, as a way to try and kind of, it's, it's on the agenda of my office for next year to, to shift the needle on, on, uh, on how it might be applied. And I think that we have cracked open our tenure and promotion criteria right now. We're in the process of a two or three year project to review them and to have criteria all approved through a central, um, uh, central committee. And there is certainly an opportunity there to, to get recognition into the pool. Uh, and we have made a recommendation to our academic policy committee to strengthen the, the, um, the policy and guidelines around use of openness. Great. Um, Nick, following up on that, uh, Leonora asks if you can share what approach was used to actually get that statement into the into Senate uh, minutes, into the Senate policy. Yeah, so it, it came through. We have this Senate uh, Student Caucus, which is uh, made up of all of the student, Senate, uh, student uh, government leaders and some other elected students. Um, and then it also has faculty from faculty representation it also has policy committee representation on it. Um, it's been a struggle to get engagement with that unit, but one of the things that they came up with uh, uh, three years ago was to revise that policy and they made it a centerpiece of what they were gonna do. They, they usually pick a couple of things every year that they want to, to do. Uh, unfortunately, what didn't happen was the student governments didn't then take it and create um, any kind of education campaign around it or really use it to push beyond just taking it to Senate. But Senate, they asked Senate to formally adopt it as a, as a memorandum to faculty and then it was sent out by the provost to all faculty. Um, and occasionally we were able to get him to do that to remind people as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, it, it reminds me too, when we, when we talk about um, establishing uh, the conditions to improve the uptake on open at our institutions, we have to look for a lot of allies. Of course, the, the, the first places we look at, of course, are the, the instructors and then the teaching support centers and things like that. But also, uh, we have other allies and other people uh, or stakeholders, really, who need to be consulted and, and, and involved in the issue. Students, as you mentioned the student caucus that you said, students in Ontario have been very active in the in in open uh, their their particular issue of course is cost of of study materials and so they've been very supportive of of reducing those kinds of costs through um through open education and another uh, another uh place to look for uh stakeholders and i think support are also our retail services and bookstores things like that because the i know at our own institution at waterloo uh sean gilbertson who works on our uh, open scholarship and working group at the university he's a fantastic advocate for open educational materials and resources and he's a, he's especially well versed in the in the issues surrounding open and and publishing and university bookstores one of the issues that he pointed out to me and I, and I hadn't really thought of it before he had mentioned it is that at some institutions then um, there could be um, an institutional issue with regard to uh, open because it, it depending on how much they're depending on the um uh, the, the the money they're making from uh, from the normal textbook sales now th this is perhaps more uh, more an issue uh, in the united states for example where um, ancillary services like bookstores may be reluctant to see an uptake on open educational materials if it means that it could affect their bottom line and that's something to be thinking about. How do you get institutions to, to think beyond those dollar and cents issues? And that, that's something I hadn't thought about. I'm not sure it's an issue at, at, on Ontario universities, but, I, um, but I'm interested in that, in that aspect as well. So I can comment really quickly um, from Please. the Outbook store. <laughs> I remember sitting down with them when I first took this role acting in 2013, and they were convinced that my job had been designed to put them out of business um, and it was it was a very kind of aggressive and 
um, uh, fear driven kind of meeting to begin with. And you flash forward to, you know, uh, last year when I sat down with them again and the meeting was proactively driven by them asking if they could um, help this cause by listing courses that have open textbooks in the regular course catalog. So we have a system that, that links our, our course catalog to the bookstores catalog and students know, you know, they regularly go there and they find what their textbooks are for the courses. And that often helps decide whether, which course they're going to enroll in. They click through to the books, okay. bookstores catalog. And now the bookstore is, is listing our open textbooks as well. Excellent. That's great. Um, I'm just uh, checking the chat here. Um, uh, Melanie writes that it also, she thinks it also depends if the bookstore is owned and run by the institution, which is of course not the case at all universities. So there is, there's a, there are a number of issues involved here for sure. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, Jenny has asked a, a slightly different, uh, well, taking conversation a little bit of a different direction. In anyone's experience is the issue of what textbook is used at the college level course, part of a concern with trans, transfer agreements. Uh, to the university level. There's a pretty persistent myth, or so, it's, so it seems, that universities prefer to see standard publisher textbooks rather than open. I don't, I'm not much involved with, with um, university tra uh, transfer between college and universities. Can anybody speak to that who's uh, in on the webinar today? Uh, maybe just my, I, I haven't heard of any pushback um, at La Cité. Um, maybe others can chime in if they have. I haven't seen it here with most of the programs that, that we're engaged with, but um, I also <laughs> wouldn't be surprised if people who looked at things for the credit transfer wouldn't have a clue whether that was an open textbook or not. So that's probably a good thing. It, it does seem to me, and, I'm, and again, I'm not involved in this, but it seems to me that's a pretty granular approach to accreditation of courses that people are looking at the textbooks used in a course. I think usually, my feeling is they might look at the course description, perhaps the syllabus, but not so much the textbooks that would be on the syllabus, but more the, the just the content delivered in the course or the content um, dealt with in the course. I think it does depend on whether it's a, um, a single credit transfer or, or multiple. block transfer. Yeah. Yeah. Block transfers, you don't, you don't really have a mechanism for checking that, but if it's a if it's a letter of permission or a single credit transfer that we're looking at, then yes, they'll look into, you know, what kind of um, text were they taught from. Right. What, uh, oh, I see, um, uh, well, there's an interesting message here from Aldo. I think we should just take a look at that if you get a chance to, to see it in the chat. Uh, talking to faculty members and strongly opposed to giving away his IP. Top-down policy. Uh, especially around our would, is important, but I wonder what other policies institutions have implemented to recognize and reward the creators. Mind shift is needed. Yeah, that's a very good question, Aldo. Thank or comment. Thanks for that. It, this this the mind shift. Let me just speak to that very briefly. The IP issue and and related issues there uh, are that that is important. Uh, some instructors are very reluctant um, to to go down that path. Um, Often I think out of ignorance as to what really that path is about. And I don't mean ignorance in terms of willful ignorance, just simply not knowing. Um, but I'm wondering, yeah, the, the, the point you're putting there, well, what, what can policy, can policy, you know, if we, can policy create the mind shift? That's really a good question about that. And that refers then to the whole, is it top down or bottom up? Where does that mind shift occur? Any comments there? One of the things that I saw at um, Open Ed, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago was there were lots of, I went to a number of presentations that were talking about how they were both adjusting policy and incentivizing faculty to engage. Um, and some places were doing things as simple as, or as small, I guess, as offering faculty $150 cash to adopt an open textbook. Um, and that was working really effectively in some places. Others were offering things like uh, course buyouts. Others were offering things like um, uh, access to resources to adopt uh, or to, to adapt open, um, not necessarily textbooks, but OERs. So I think it's got to be a combination of things. 
That's that's interesting. Why is it that we feel the need? Why do why do we think that if if say I'm ad, uh, I'm adopting a textbook uh, a commercial textbook for a course or a commercial program for a course, why why wouldn't why wouldn't I ask the university to give me time to adapt that to my course as well? I mean, it seems to me that that's um, to say that for some reason I I don't understand why we have to why we have to make these extra incentives for open, but perhaps it's because we we simply have to get it onto people's radar somehow. I'm not sure, but that kind of that, that that rubs me the wrong way a little bit. Yeah, I might chime in just quickly here. Um, at, La, at La Cité, uh, a couple of years back, so I think three years back, there was a risk assessment done at La Cité, and, and, and the top five risks, I don't remember the top five risks, but the top risk that was identified by this external audit firm was the fact that there was not, nothing left by any teacher at La Cité. So you, you teach 30 years at La Cité, You've done your, your, your gig, yeah. you go to retirement, there's nothing left. Yeah. So, so this firm said, this is a big risk for you as an organization. And the, the, the reflex from the organization was, okay, well, we need to grab all the stuff that, that's happening because we want to um, minimize this risk. And this is where the open movement and the open policy thing became interesting, is the fact that it, when, when we tried, we did the pilot with this um, retiring professor to build material OER, this was doing two things, right? Assessing or minimizing this risk. If we do this at, at a larger scale, we'll minimize this risk. Plus, plus second thing is we will um, mature senior professors will be creating OERs, and this will probably have a benefic effect with other faculties at La and other faculty members at La Cité. So why it's functioning, why I think we're having some good traction at La Cité is we are actually minimizing this risk that foreign administrators is super important, but at the same time creating a ground roots movement with our senior faculty members. So I think those are the type of initiatives that I see can really move the needle forward. Thanks for that, uh, Michelle. Um, I'd refer people, we won't go into the, but there's some really good comments coming up in the, um, in the chat section. So be sure to read those, following up on all those comments. And then also from Naomi uh, Salman from uh, UW Wisconsin about uh, issues there around uh, TA uh, teaching assistant pay and fairness and the involvement in open material creation. So thanks for those comments. Uh, I noticed the time, it's uh, about 10 to two. And I, uh, I'm wondering, are there any um, final comments or uh, questions that anyone might have to, to pose to the, 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 our two panelists or to anyone uh, participating in the webinar? Can I just, uh, just make one quick comment about something that's odd that I've encountered recently here? And, um, and it was also a significant topic of conversation at Open Ed, um, was this idea that uh, faculty who chose open resources would get some kind of unfair advantage over those who chose publishing textbooks, publisher textbooks in, um, in their sections because students would want to use their sections rather than, than others. It was, it's like, it's an actual argument here. People are saying, well, that's not fair. If they choose a, a free textbook, then everyone's going to want to take their section. Uh, <laughs> my response is, yeah. <laughs> why not um, so yeah the, it, it, it's so the teaching materials and the way that we teach is so personal and deeply ingrained in, in uh, academic identity that it is really tricky to, to mess with and that's part of the messiness of working in this field yeah thanks for that comment that's a very good point I did have I did have one this I don't want to open a can of worms right at the end of the of the uh, session here, but I do have one question uh, about ZedCred, and this might be of interest, or perhaps people who are more familiar with it can can enlighten me. But ZedCred is ZedCred really a uh, is that really the most productive way to institutionalize open? Because it it seems to me that it's 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 going to necessarily be limited to a to a smaller group of programs or academic programs or um, yeah, curricula. Um, I'm, I'm thinking just in my own field of uh, in, in the work I do, where it would be hard, for example, to 
have people read contemporary literature and not have them buy the, the, the actual novels to read that literature, which would then negate the whole Zed cred notion of no cost, no material cost involved. So is that really the best approach or is that something like a, an ideal that we want to try to approach and every step in that direction is a good one? Hi, it's Jenny James. Mm -hmm. I, can ask, yep. I can speak to that a little bit, um, just because it's a, you know strong area of interest for me. Yeah, um, please. In in the way that the kind of that um, Nick just described, where they what you might create is is impoverished disciplines who aren't using open, who are no longer getting people to come to their disciplines. Um, mm. There's a risk actually with with doing zero textbook courses and programs that those programs will be more popular because they're less expensive. And what might be at stake is, is reduction in enrollments for programs where, as you say, for modern literature, where there really is no substitute for the study of the work without purchasing it. So I think it's kind of an interesting, it is an, a bit of an interesting can of worms um, to open. And I think, you know, there's, there are many programs where open is, um, is not uh, a possibility. And so lots in the open community talk about using open educational resources when appropriate and when possible. And sometimes neither of those things are true and open resources are actually not a good solution. So I think it's an interesting part uh, of policy conversations. If you're promoting zero textbooks as the most amazing thing that's ever happened in higher education, you wanna be a little bit careful for those disciplines where it's, it's not appropriate or possible. No, oh, thanks, thanks, Jenny. And, I, and Nick has added some comments to the chat that um, talk about the the use of uh, like a, trying to go for low cost and using library resources, etc., which are of course valid points. Um, I personally, I have nothing more to add other than thanks for all of our um, for our participants, for Nick and for. Um, uh, Michelle's uh, contributions. If anyone else has anything they'd like to add uh, before we hand it back to Jenny, I think she has a couple of things she wants to close out with. Is, is like class, hearing nothing? <laughs> I dismiss you. <laughs> I, I, I turn it over to Jenny um, and thanks to, again to all of you uh, for participating and for um, being part of this webinar. Really appreciate your taking the time today to, to to be a part of this. Jenny. Great. Thank you, James, Nick, Michelle. That was really great uh, leadership on this particular topic and all really great questions from the audience. Um, at every one of our webinars for the OEL, OE Fellow series, we have been giving away a, a copy of a book. And the book is called An Urgency of Teachers by Sean Michael Morris and Jesse Stommel. Uh, and it's hot off the press and very popular in the open community right now because uh, they talk a lot about the critical issues in open and digital teaching and learning, which is great. So um, our winner of the book today, just by random draw, is Mirto Provida. So <laughs> congratulations, Mirto. Um, we'll make sure we connect with you by email and, and get your book. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're it's welcome. It's rigged. It's all rigged. Yeah, it's totally rigged. It really was pretty random. Um, and also, I just want to promote our next OE Fellows um, webinar on... Uh, Tuesday, November 20th, with Helen DeWard, Laura Killam, and Jessica O'Reilly, and they will be talking about open educational practices. So you can check on our eCampus Ontario website under the OE Fellows page for more information and to register. Um, and also coming up, we have our Open Education Ontario Summit this coming Sunday and our TESS um, events. So check our eCampus Ontario web pages because we're going to be sharing out some live uh, feeds from TESS and we're gonna be doing some virtually connecting. So those are the kinds of things we've got going on. Uh, and it was great to see everyone today. So thank you all for your uh, attention. This was a really large and great lively group with lots of questions. Thanks. Is there anything further that we can, we can share? Just let me know. Um, and you can connect with me. I'll put my email down here in the chat if you wanna reach anyone or you wanna reach me. All right, thank you everyone, have a great day. Thanks Jenny, thanks everyone.